as we gather to so th that was the problem as we gather today for this lecture i am reminded of the remarkable journey that the oxford pakistan bro uh, program has been through four years since its inception housed at lmh the opp mission is to create substantial opportunities for pakistanis and british pakistani students here at oxford this mission is brought to life through series of scholarships studentships and access programs which this year alone enabled 11 graduate students to study here at oxford in addition to the financial support the opp is also dedicated to strengthen academic and cultural ties between oxford and pakistan through this series we connect voices and bring ideas from the global stage to the students of pakistan i'm proud to announce that this event will be televised to scholars across 50 universities through pakistan reaching students in remote locations such as women university in mardan university of turbat in balochistan and karakoram university in gilgit baltistan through this model of engagement we aim to bring global discourses to students who would not otherwise have the opportunity to engage with such distinguished speakers we believe in the power of education to cross borders and transform lives and it's through these initiatives that we continue to uphold and expand on that belief in one of his famous verses iqbal highlights the importance of intellectual freedom azad ka andesha haqeeqat se munawwar mahkoom ka andesha giraftar e kharafat a free person's mind is lit with the flame of truth the mind of a slave is darkened with superstitions through this lecture series we would like you to think about the concept of freedom and sovereignty of thought this lecture series is graciously funded by the dada boy foundation whose trustees abdullah dada boy and abdul ghani dada boy have joined us online they are repre represented here today by habibullah dada boy so the running order we will start by welcoming remarks by anna bates the development director of lmh this would be followed by professor adil malik the academic lead of the oxford pakistan program who will give a talk on the vision behind the lecture and introduce the speaker then over to our distinguished guest miss karen armstrong who will speak for 45 to 60 minutes followed by an a q and a session which would be moderated by professor fitzroy morrissey this would be followed by a vote of thanks by habibullah dada boy um, and he'll present um, uh, a token of appreciation a gift that he's brought from pakistan for miss karen armstrong we are hoping to finish by 6:30 um, and uh, we look forward to look forward to the lecture over to you anna thank you very much thank you so my name is anna bates and i'm director of development here at lady margaret hall and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here today to those in person and to those joining us online For those of you that don't know us, Lady Margaret Hall is one of the constituent colleges of the University of Oxford. We were founded in 1878, almost 150 years ago, as the first college to open up an education to women in the university. And it's that pioneering and inclusive part of our community which we're very proud of and remains with us to this day. We have a long-standing relation with the Pakistani community. We were the College of Benazir Bhutto back in the 1970s and more recently Malala and we are very proud to now be partnering with the Oxford Pakistan program both through welcoming their graduate scholars to our community but also by hosting the annual Iqbal lecture so I very much hope you enjoy the next hour or so with us thank you again to our sponsors and to our speaker and I'll hand over to press to press our deal to welcome thank you Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you all. I realize that I am standing between you and the esteemed speaker, so I'll be very short. Um, allow me a few minutes to provide you a brief vision for this lecture series. Um, for the last 17 years that I've served here as an Oxford academic, 
I've long desired for there to be a series that is dedicated to uh, celebrating um, uh, the legacy of a major intellectual figure from the East. Um, in Western academia, we often bemoan of lack of diversity, uh, and a frequent lament is that our reading lists are too Western-centric and that our students need to adequately uh, hear perspectives and contributions from the Global South. The Alam Iqbal lecture series is a humble effort to fill this gap. Muhammad Iqbal, as you know, is one of the most influential Muslim thinkers of the 20th century. Much can be said about his intellectual legacy. But for me, as a political economist, Iqbal represents both a symbol of resistance and reform. Uh, resistance to, um, to structures of power. Uh, he critiqued tyrannical rule in Muslim societies, which is often hereditary and monarchic. He opposed landlords for their oppressive hold over the rural peasantry, advocated the rights of the poor, criticized established religious classes for doing the ruler's bidding and selling their pen to the powerful. He critiqued many isms, including capitalism and socialism. And as Tala has noted, for Iqbal, the struggle for sovereign existence starts from a rediscovery of the self. Iqbal wanted people who are subjugated and excluded um, by exploitative structures to shape the future on their own terms. The moral and ethical dimensions are central to his intellectual paradigm, and he's unapologetic about the potential for religion um, and Muslim civilization experience in creating a more just and humane social order. Yet his philosophic thought strikes a universal chord. It is built on what he describes in his own words as one time, one life, one universe. He thus hoped for a common ethical ideal that could pave the way for what he calls the final combination of humanity. Iqbal is thus ever more relevant for many of the existential challenges of our time. He carries the best filament of the Abrahamic tradition, a filament that can be used to foster interreligious dialogue that our world needs so badly today. Um, he provides the intellectual platform for an authentic and constructive engagement between Islam and the West. It is in this regard that it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Karen Armstrong today. She's one of the best living authors on religion. She's reached millions of people through her writings um, and her broadcasting experience. She's written many, many bestsellers, including The Holy War, The History of God, The Prophet, um, and is widely followed across the world. And I'm so happy that students in Pakistan would be able to hear her live as she speaks from Oxford. Um, so without further ado, perhaps I could invite my colleague, Professor Fitzroy Morrissey to come to the stage. He'll be uh, chairing uh, and moderating the Q&A after Karen's talk. And Karen, uh, a very warm welcome to you. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Oops. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's it's very good to be here. Very good to be here with you all. Um, so uh, this is what is religion? To start off with a with a with a short question, what is religion? We think about prayer, theology, and action. But what are we looking for when we say we are searching for God? Uh, when we know that God lies beyond anything we can think uh, of or imagine, and yet we go on searching. Um, the, the catechism definition, uh, which I learned at the age of seven or eight, uh, went like this, what is God? And in a single question, single sentence, it came out, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. I have to say that at eight, that didn't mean very much to me. Um, and I now think it was incorrect because it takes for granted that you can simply draw breath and define a word which literally means to set limits upon, they finish, a reality that lies beyond what we can imagine or think or even conceive. Um, and um, so religion is not a matter really of thinking. Um, we, we do think a lot about it. We do uh, meditations, but uh, it, all, it is mainly about doing. 
that very often uh, our mind is altered by uh, actions, physical actions we know. Uh, that's why it's so important in, in the Muslim world for people to bow and to, uh, and, 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 and to, when I was a nun, we used to kiss the ground. Um, and that gives you a sense, uh, it does things in your, to your inside uh, about uh, humility, about the littleness of oneself. Um, but um, what, what is God? Um, it's a difficult question. And I, I think I answered it in a, in a single sentence. God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Um, but we, that, that doesn't really tell us anything. And we, it's, we don't know what God is. God goes beyond us. We can't define it, uh, which means setting limits upon. Uh, we learn about the sacred and the divine more by doing things. Um, that is why uh, Muslims, for example, uh, prostrate themselves on the ground. That those, those bodily actions actually speak to us very, very much more distinctly than a few uh, scholarly words. Um, there's um, the, the catechism definition is pretty grim. God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. It didn't mean very much to me at all. But um, what meant much more to me was when I encountered a 14th century English text called The Cloud of Unknowing. It was by a monk uh, who, we don't know who his name was. It was, it was uh, quite, uh, he kept himself quite sacred, uh, sacred but it is a, a very wonderful. Um, uh, he, he, he talks in English, it's, 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 it's one of the earliest uh, prose English uh, books that we have uh, in mind. And he asks this, but now you are going to ask me, how am I to think of God himself and what is he? And I cannot answer you except to say, I do not know. For with this question, you have brought me into the same darkness the same cloud of unknowing where I want you to be. For though we through the grace of God can know fully about all other matters, and although we can think about them, yes, even the very words of God himself, yet of God himself can no man think. Why? because he may well be loved, but not thought. By love, he can be thought and held, but by thinking, never. Therefore, though it may be good sometimes to think about particularly about what good God's kindness and worth, yet in the work that is now before us, it must be put down and covered with a cloud of forgetting. Strike that thick cloud of unknowing, with the sharp dart of, it, 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 of longing love, and on no account whatever think of giving up. By darkness, I mean a lack of knowing. Just as anything you do not know or may have forgotten may be said to be dark to you. For this reason, it's called a cloud, not of the sky, of course, but of unknowing a cloud of unknowing that limits our vision between you and your God. Um, because uh, when we try and rationalize God, uh, we, we kill it. It's something that we acquire mainly by doing things. You know, Muslims, for example, who prostrate themselves, kiss the ground. I did that quite a lot myself as a nun. And these bodily actions introduce uh, a certain uh, dimension of uh, humility, longing, uh, but it's still God remains elusive and God must remain elusive. 
because once you think you've got God uh, carefully uh, tied up and you know exactly what God is, that is not God. That is a uh, God that has been limited in, in, in some respects. But the main thing that we have to do is, is lack of ego. It's our, it's, we are obsessed with ourselves. We are obsessed with our own feelings, with our own uh, it, it, failings, uh, uh, the mistakes we've made, the yearning we have, uh, our longing for things, uh, me, me, me. Uh, what we have to try and do in religion is put me to one side. Um, that's why it's important, first of all, uh, to do certain uh, physical actions. When I was a nun, for example, we used to kiss the ground. Um, and when, when we entered, if we, if we were late or something. Now, these things may seem a bit odd, or but they do... Bodily actions do something to us. They, they speak to us more than a lot of clever words can do. Um, and somehow uh, we need to think, uh, not, not just keep thinking about God, but thinking about how little we know about the divine. And seeing the divine in other people, that's why uh, in India, when people meet one another, they join their hands and bow because not because they're bowing to that person, but because they're speaking, they're, they're, they're acknowledging the sacrality, the divinity that that is enshrined in that person. Um, and just as we should try and do it with uh, nature, for example, uh, which should fill us with, with admiration and, um, and, and, and wonder, wonder and nature is something like god that we depend upon every single moment for uh for our breath for our sight uh we depend upon uh the, the natural world for for everything and uh that natural world is full of the divine but we need a lack of ego a surrender um, and for a forgetfulness of self. That's where the golden rule comes in, because how do you get rid of yourself? How do you uh, limit that ego that is always crying out, me, 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 I want this, my failures, my successes, my desires? Uh, the uh, golden rule, never treat others as you would not wish to be treated yourself. Uh, this was first enunciated by Confucius, uh, who said, you do it all day and every day, not just when you feel like it. Uh, look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. Do not do to others what you would not do to yourself. It means putting yourself to one side and putting yourself in the shoes of another. What we need, what gives us uh, a sense of the divine and of, about the sense of meaning in life is to get beyond ourselves, beyond the ego, which we get so involved with and enticed with. Uh, and the, the religions, at their best, three very important little words, are what uh, is, you have to do. This is religion. Now, um, the Greeks called it kenosis, emptying. Um, so uh, you empty yourself. Uh, no more putting ourselves first or pushing ourselves first into the limelight, uh, bringing it, drawing attention to ourselves, to our cleverness, uh, to, our, uh, to, to, to when we're angry or when it's all about me, 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 leaving that behind, kenosis. Uh, speak carefully, it says, to the people of the book. Uh, no more putting ourselves, our ideas or our beliefs first. Um, so 
a very early, very early myth, going right back to the 10th century BC in India, uh, introduces us to uh, a Purusha, the person. Uh, he, it, he, it's the first, it's the very first human being, uh, the person, uh, and he stand, he stands, he takes himself to the um, gods, lies down, and allows them to sacrifice him. And out of that sacrifice come the rest of creation. Uh, horses, cattle, heaven, earth, uh, and moon, and even some of the gods emerge from 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 this this dead man that has given his life to uh, to the world, an, an act of utter selflessness that we need, in some way or another, to fill our own lives day by day hour by hour, putting ourselves to one side. Because it is, uh, it is our selfishness, our egocentricity, that holds us back from the divine and from our better selves. Um, and it, it, requires, it requires difficulty. Um, yoga, is, this is what people do. I've never been any good at yoga, I have to say. I, I, I'm not good at med meditation at all. I, uh, I had very bad time of this kind of uh, prayer when I was a nun. It, it didn't suit me somehow. Uh, but yoga is not a, an aerobic exercise uh, that people do in the gym or learn to breathe in a separate way. It, it, it was originally demanding um, the, to, so that you put aside the self. Uh, he had the uh, yoga he had to do the opposite of what came naturally. He would sit so still that he was more like a plant than a human being. Um, he controlled his breathing so much uh, that it, it 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 changed the way he thought um, and 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 he silenced the the thoughts and ideas that rush through our brains every minute of the day putting them down carefully, methodically, not angrily, because anger is a sign of selfishness and ego and me, me, me when you're angry, but just quietly saying, no, no, put that down, put that down, uh, sort of an, an emptiness. Um, and uh, this, is, this is what people were doing with yoga. For, for that time. Very different, I think, from what goes on in certain gyms today. Uh, it's not just um, an aerobic exercise. It was also a, a, a way of, get, of getting yourself out of ego, out of the self, um, silencing the thoughts that come racing into our minds every five minutes, Put it, not, not in an angry way, but putting them down quietly, uh, one by one, so that the mind can become a little bit empty and, and, and breathing in a certain way. Um, I've never been very good at it. Um, and I was never very good at meditation, which was rather a drawback for a nun, uh, where we, we had to meditate every morning and I couldn't do it. Uh, for me, uh, the, the, uh, what, what would give me a moment of uplift would be the Gregorian chant, for example the music, which touches you at a level deeper than the rational, perhaps, and lifts you momentarily above, above yourselves. Um, but, um, but a lot of people uh, do find uh, this, this kind of uh, yog yogic activity helpful. Um, I, I just didn't have the, the capacity for it. Uh, uh, but uh, we all have to find our own ways of stilling the mind. Um, and it may be by meditation, or it may be by just sitting in the garden, listening to the sounds and uh, of, of the trees and the birds, and just emptying your mind of all the thoughts, 
ideas and anxieties that rush through our minds every moment of the day, that keep us awake at night, that disturb us uh, in, in our uh, anxieties when we were meeting other people or uh, our troubles, uh, just quiet, put things quietly to one side and open a space and do it quietly. Don't sort of say, stop this, stop this, just gently and start letting other things get through like uh, the birds or the ins little insects cr crawling around the garden, uh, becoming aware of life outside yourself, but in silence, opening yourself to something and putting the self to one side. Um, but the, the main uh, a chief uh, way of acquiring uh, a sense of the divine is in all religions, the essence, the, the virtue of compassion. The ability to feel with the other, compassion means to feel passion, uh, to feeling with passio, to suffer with, uh, con with, with other people but not endlessly running around about me, mine, and ego, which we do all the time, which we, uh, we, wake, up, we wake up at night, uh, we, we think full of our, our, our anxieties, we think of our failures, we think of, our, of how uh, of our desires, our yearnings, put them quietly to one side, not slamming them down, just gently quietly uh, opening your mind and just listening to say the birds or the rain or the wind, just opening your a little bit every day and every day getting a bit longer. I've never been very good at prayer, which was a bit of a disadvantage as a nun, I must say, uh, because I, I could, I found it very, very difficult to speak to God uh, the music was fine. Uh, the Gregorian chant with its particular emphases uh, touches, touches you at a level deeper than the verbal and the rational um, and, and can open you out. That did that better for me than, than, than for a lot of, of talk, but it's, um, it's the emptying of oneself, kenosis, that makes room for the divine. Uh, the Buddha, it's not, it said, made it quite clear that it was not about theology. Um, you, must, you must act in a certain way that puts the ego to one side. Never speak unkindly to people. Never snap at somebody. Never let an, an, a disagreeable thought uh, about another person or an, a, a, another happening dwell in your mind and uh, poison it and, and, and make you angry because all this enhances our sense of self and self-importance. Self what we need to do is lay that all just quietly to one side and open yourself to the sounds, the birds, the insects running around, the, just open, uh, to open your mind. Um, I, sometimes uh, pe people I know are, are helped by prayer and music. Music is very important. Music touches us deeply within and lifts us momentarily beyond ourselves, but not in a verbal way. Uh, it opens us up to various kinds of feelings and 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 emotions, uh, and that is 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 why music has been so tremendously important uh, in in religion. Um, above all, it's getting beyond ego, but getting beyond me, mine, and uh, what. What, what is happening, it's called, in, in Greek, it's called kenosis, emptying, the emptying of self. Uh, because God was everywhere, uh, there was, it says, no space for the world. There's no place where God is not. So uh, when you're 
in the presence of uh, the birds, the trees, the animals, you are in contact with a sacredness. Just let that enter your mind. It's, but above all is to get beyond the ego, to stop thinking about me and mine uh, and what I want to do and how I'm failing or how bad I am at meditation, putting it to one side. Um, Judaism. Mm. Um, after being cast out of Spain by the Inquisition in the 15th century, uh, they, they, the mystic Isaac Luria developed a new kind of mystical Kabbalah, which began with the act of kenosis, emptying. Because ev God was everywhere, there was no space for the world, no place where God is not. So God is inscrutable, unknowable, but everywhere um, and beyond us. For Paul, uh, I am a great admirer of St. Paul. I used to dis dislike him very much when I was uh, at school. Uh, he always seemed to be telling people off. And of course, he only wrote seven of those letters. Uh, but I became very attached to him when I did a, a series on uh, for Channel 4 with them and, and, and actually uh, follow, followed in his foot, footsteps and uh, focused on the um, letters that Paul actually wrote. He only wrote seven of them. Uh, a lot of them were written in, in his name in the, in the early second century. Uh, they were think that, so Paul uh, has, is, 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 is uh, the, the founder, I think, of, of Christianity. It is he who uh, was able to, say, to, to take uh, the, the, the message of Jesus. Um, and it's, this is the first uh, of the Christian writings that were uh, written 20 years, some 20 years after Jesus' death. But it's, it's getting beyond ego. Um, that uh, is, 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 is what, he, and he, you do it uh, not just by sitting there and having uh, great deep seated arguments with, within yourself, but by reaching out to other people, by recognizing the divine that you see in the people around you. Uh, it's the people in India do this very well when they join hands and they bow when they are greeting one another, recognizing the sacrality that is in that, that person. Uh, we should try and do that, to recognize that each person that may look utterly uh, uninteresting, uh, un unworthy of notice in a sense, is sacred, uh, has his, his or her own particular life, his or her own particular anxieties, his or her own particular visions, is each person we meet is a world unknown um, and somehow uh, sh should be uh, revered. And if we try and do that with just, if you look at someone in the, in the bus or think of what perhaps they might be going through, what they might have, have been doing in their lives, what might their troubles be, and linking them with your, your own troubles. And you begin to see uh, how confused and uh, troubled we are a great deal at the time. Um, and uh, this is, uh, and hence we get so worked up about ourselves. That's why that reaching out to others gets us out of that ego. That's why uh, compassion, the ability to feel with compassio uh, is so important because it gets us beyond ourselves and can help other people. Um, now, um, Islam, the word Islam means surrender. Um, and that means the surrender of the ego. The very first thing that, um, The Prophet Muhammad um, 
asked Muslims to do was to bow uh, their heads to the ground in kenosis because we learn a lot from our bodies. Uh, we, we think we're, it's all in our minds that we do these things, but our bodies teach us things that are, that are deeper than the rational. Um, and um, it's wrong. It, the Quran uh, is, it, is sometimes a rather daunting text, but its message is really very simple. It's wrong to build a private fortune and good to share your wealth and create a just society where the poor and vulnerable are treated with absolute respect. In the Quran, faith is not something that you think, but it's something that you do. People, you must share your wealth with others, perform works of justice and kindness and compassion. And, uh, and similarly to we learning through your bodies, we don't do that so much uh, in the West. Uh, but the idea of the prostrations that Islam does, the first, some of the first things that Muslims were taught to do was to prostrate themselves, to, so that they, their, their foreheads touched the ground. And that, that, those physical acts, they may not seem to send a message immediately to your brain, but we learn a lot from our bodies, and that helps to create a certain mentality of, of bowing and reverence and concern for others. Um, in Islam, um, the word Islam means surrender. And it means uh, to, to, to give up the ego, to surrender the self, day by day, hour by hour. Um, and um, so that's... Um, it, it would be wrong to see Islam as a new religion because this is what all the religions were trying to do. It's what Buddhism tries to do. It's what yoga tries to do, is to get rid of ego, day by day, hour by hour. And you can do it, not many people, I, I can't do yoga, and I'm a complete uh, dud at meditation. Um, I couldn't do it for you know as a nun uh, somehow. But for me, um, reading... Uh, a, a book, a, a sacred book, suddenly I can get a, a moment of uh, wonder or awe, or listening, sitting outside sometimes and listening to the birds or seeing the insects running around, just taking you out of yourself and letting uh, the world and its wonders and its difficulties seep into your mind and, and heart. Um, the, one of my chief uh, uh, heroes, of course, is Confucius. Uh, he had very little time to speak about the divine. Um, he teach his his uh, doctrine was the golden rule: never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourselves. Do not do to others what you would not like done to you. Uh, that's spread around in all uh, the world religions. But it is that that is the best way of approaching the divine, I think. Getting rid of that ego, that endless con concern with me, 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 and mine, mine, mine. What am I doing? How am I doing? Am I praying well? Uh, leave that. It's not important. Put it to one side. And you do it. Uh, Confucius said, all day and every day, not just when you're feeling like it, but uh, moment, moment by moment, uh, all day and every day, uh, and res show absolute respect for others. And we don't do that enough. We're rushing through, uh, the, through towns, that's trampling ourselves on buses and trains, uh, uh, driving cars, uh, and 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 looking at other people who flash past us, instead of seeing the absolute sacrality and that each person is unique, separate, sacred, and divine. Um, this it's this that takes you beyond yourself. Uh, we look think about transcendence a lot as visions and dreams and ecstasies. 
and a lot of the saints went in for that. Uh, but uh, ecstasy means it's stepping outside, stepping outside the self, putting yourself momentarily in other people's shoes, looking at an, a person and wondering what they are thinking, what they might have suffered. Each person that we come across is a, a, a little universe. Each person has its own extraordinary history. Each person has its own private tragedies, its own uh, yearnings, um, and its own, its own history. And we pass by them with such uh, casualty as though we, that they're not important. Each person is unique. And I think if we try uh, in, uh, in when we're on a bus or in a train to just take a person and think that that person is as complex as I am, as probably as troubled as I am, has a history that I will never know. That a person is a whole world, a whole little universe uh, that uh, is separate and for that person of absolute importance. Um, it takes religion. Uh, religion is about getting rid of the self. It's, we, we worry about God, and I, I spent a long time as a, as a young girl trying to, and as a young nun, trying to speak to God, trying to meditate about God, but I never really succeeded. God remained uh, very, very distant, except perhaps in the Gregorian chant where the, where the music hits you uh, at a deeper place. Music hit, takes us deeper than the purely rational. It opens up uh, whole uh, universes within ourselves, whole elements of, 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 of pain, emotion, memory. Um, that's why the, that's the great power of music. Um, and it, it's that, I think, that can help us to get outside the little prison of ourselves. Um, one day, uh, a Brahmin priest came across the Buddha who was sitting in contemplation under a tree. And the Buddha looked so serene, so calm, so wise, he said, are you a god, sir? And uh, the Buddha said, no. He explained that he had simply revealed a new potential in human nature, that it was possible to live in this violent world at peace with one's fellow creatures. There was no point in believing this, he said, you would only discover it if you've just made that a truth for yourself and did it for yourself. You would then live at this peak of your capacity and become a fully enlightened human being, looking at each person as a separate universe filled with that everybody, this, everybody in this room with, its, with his or her own history, his or her own desires, yearnings that we'll never know about. Um, and that, uh, that that should fill us with wonder at the, at the, that each one of us has such profundity, has such yearnings, uh, and that makes us feel less lonely about ourselves. And basically, we love God, we say, or at least I've never been able to say that. Um, I've tried to love God, but I think I do that best by trying to love people and seeing that, that as I say, each person being that I meet is, is a complete 
new universe, each with his or her own particular sorrows, yearnings, and brilliance. Each people, we, we, we are all uh, worlds unto ourselves. Uh, compassion, not feeling sorry for people, but feeling with them. Not about liking them, but feeling with them, realizing that each person has his own, his or her own particular world, his or her own history. Is a, each person is a mystery, and if we that, that's why the uh, Buddhists are so good when they reach you with a bow, they are bowing the sacrality that they are beating in each person. That is something that we should do, and similarly with the natural world. Uh, by loving people and nature, we come to love ourselves. Uh, we begin to see that perhaps we're not quite as bad or as pe pe petty-minded or as uh, selfish as we think. Uh, that we are able to put ourselves out towards other people and see each person as an incarnation of the divine. And that enables us to let the self go. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much, Karnapsa, uh, for that marvelous talk. Um, if I might uh, say a few words, just to say what a privilege it is to, to have been asked to um, post this Q&A um, as part of this great initiative. We obviously have some program, particularly. Um, can you hear it so that it's live stream? So uh, uh -huh. no. Sorry. Sit down. Well, for the, okay. um, and just to say what a privilege it is to, to um, be asked to host uh, the Q&A for following your talk. Um, my own interest in the academic study of religion, and particularly of Islam, was very much catalyzed by uh, reading your own work. Um, I think um, just reflecting on, on your wider body of work, um, which I think your talk um, very much uh, is in keeping with, uh, if I might um, exploit my position as the uh, as chair of the Q&A task, the first question. Um, I think um, two of your really uh, major contributions to the public understanding of religion um, through your work ha have been first um, to bring to public attention not only many of the great classics of spirituality from the world's great religious traditions, and we, we had reference to a number of them tonight, but also um, the ideas of a number of the most important theorists, academic scholars of religion of the 20th century, I think particularly of um, Carl Jaspers, um, Wilfred Campbell Smith, and others. Um, so I wonder if you could say a bit about who um, has really guided your own thinking on this question of the nature of religion and who is it that we should be reading and who, and the students in Pakistan should be reading. Um, and second, another of your um, great contributions, I think, has been to articulate a defense of religion against its many critics through this distinction that you draw between two ideal types of religion, on the one hand, the, the rationalist, the literalist, the rules-based, the propositional, and on the other, um, which we've heard you speak about tonight, the experiential, um, the mystical, the practical. Um, and I wonder um, if I could ask whether you see any value in the, I mean, clearly your sympathies lie with, with, the, with the latter, but what value is there, do you think, if any, in the rationalist, in the rules-based? Because if we think, for instance, of the Sufi tradition, um, there's very much an emphasis on adherence to the Sharia, um, on 
meditation upon scripture um on articulating mystical ideas in propositional form so i wonder whether you could reflect a bit on the relationship between those two, two types of religion that you rationalism and rationalism and uh, experiential religion on the other hand i don't know really um rash i don't find religion very rational um i think uh it it Obviously, it's rational because we think logically, um, and we we use our minds to uh, look look at look look around the world and see what's going wrong and and uh, but I don't see religion. Uh, I know there are religious uh, re there are religious rationalists, um, and they always seem to be a bit dead to me. Um, they we you, the, the, I I learned a lot of, uh, about. Um, uh, you know, theology and uh, ra rather rationalistic theology, but theology is about feeling as well. It's not just about uh, thoughts and it's about going beyond the reason in a sense, going beyond logic. Um, and I've never been very good at that. Um, I, I get, I can free myself from logic by listening to music, for example, which hits me uh, deeply within and lifts me above, above myself. Um, and I've never been very good at meditation, which was a real sort of downer when I was a nun, as you can imagine, uh, where we had to meditate every day. I could not keep my mind on it uh, for five minutes. Whereas when I'm doing my study at, on my desk, the I, I'm just completely lost in my work. Um, and for me, so, so, so for me, I haven't really ex been very... Uh, good at uh, I, this kind of uh, um, spirituality. Uh, for me, uh, the the moment I can get moments of spirituality when I, in nature, for example, we're just looking at the beauty of nature. I sit in my garden, I listen to the birds, and that's that lifts me. Uh, or you know, wonderful mountains, or the. But um, for me, uh, it's I, I it. it it's study that has brought up, that gives me moments of insight. Uh, when I'm deeply, deeply immersed in uh, some, a theology uh, discussion and suddenly a little spark comes that opens me out or makes me see something that I hadn't seen before. Uh, that, uh, but, um, so what was your other question? Um, who would you recommend uh, students and Oh, Wilfred Cadwell Smith. Yeah. Uh, definitely. He he completely changed my, my way of thinking. Um, he's a bit uh sort of wordy. Uh he, he's not an exactly an easy read, but he does make you think. He did make you he's dead, of course, but he, he does make you think uh and make you think differently about about things, but in a in a rational way that is also an emotional way. I reckon, rec recognize uh I recommend his books to everybody. Uh but for poetry, I think helps a great deal. Um Jared Manley Hopkins, for example. Uh Tennyson, I that was my ill-fated D Phil. Uh, doctor, I, I failed my PhD at Oxford uh, on, on uh, Tennyson's language and poetic style. Uh, but I did love Tennyson's language and poetic style nonetheless. Um, and, um, and, and, th and, and there are wonderful moments when he talks about nature uh, himself with beauty, uh, because, uh, you know, the beautiful language helps to lift you. Uh, lift you, uh, that's what, what poetry does. It, it takes you out of the rational, out of the logical, out of the critical, that way, way, and into a moment where you just get moments, little moments of awe and wonder, and oh, I see. Uh, that, that, that I, I've never been able to acquire anything more uh, substantial in the spiritual life than that, those up little moments of uplift uh, during, during study. Thank you. Well, I think that's a note of encouragement for our DPhil students that <laughs> all is not lost. Yeah. Um, great. I'm sure there are lots of questions from uh, our audience. So if you could raise your hand. Yes, please. Sir. So, 
Ja, ja, ja. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming. First of all, my question was that your message resonated a lot with me, overcoming the ego, you know, that you can connect to God through love. And I feel like whenever I go to church or mosque, any religious place, I feel it, right? So this makes me wonder that, can you have faith without religion? And what does it mean to have faith? What did faith? What depends what you mean by faith? Uh, do you because a lot of uh, faith seems to mean believing things, uh, believing certain uh, uh, theological uh, ideas, uh, believing in the existence of a God, that kind of thing. Whereas I sometimes feel that um, uh, that doesn't really help. Uh, you can get sort of bogged down in some of these uh, sort of very, very abstruse discussions of the nature of God. I have tried to read Thomas Aquinas, uh, but um, it, 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 it doesn't, it, it has never sort of touched me in a sense, great theologian though he was. Um, I think we're more moved uh, by poetry that touches us emotionally uh, that poetry links things up, perhaps in a non-rational way, but thing but gives us new insights into uh, the way things are connected, um, and the beauty of the words, the beauty of the sound in poetry, actually helps you much more than a, a clear-cut logical rational. Uh, it it lifts you lifts you above. That's why poetry and and music, which does the same thing, uh, take touches you deeply within, as music does, lifts you momentarily beyond yourself. Uh, that's as far as I get. I was hopeless at meditation as a nun. Um, I We had to sort of, uh, it was, just wasn't the right kind of meditation for me. We had to uh, prepare the meditation the night before and take in, make notes as to how you were going to in the St. Ignatius, according to St. Ignatius's Loyola, uh, his, his sort of pattern for meditation, you started off picturing something, then you asked a series of questions about it, and then you came to a conclusion as to what you were going to do as a result of that thinking in the coming day. I never got beyond the first part. I could not, it wasn't the right kind of meditation for me. Uh, I get meditation uh, moments of insight more from poetry uh, or for, from music, uh, things that sort of touch you or, or make, you, make you link up with things that you hadn't thought of before. Or music touches us enormously. That's why it's it's so important in 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 religion uh, with the hymns, the, the, the Bach, for example. Uh, it it lifts you. Uh, and uh, because we are we are very mundane creatures, uh, we struggle. We've all got uh, sort of problems in our heads, um, and we're looking for meaning in life. We need to feel that life has some significance for it. What we're doing has some significance, um, and that's sometimes difficult. So, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask another question. Do you uh, do you think culture can replace that? Like I, uh, when I was studying theology, that oh, there's been decline in churches and decline in religion. The UK, the Br Br Britain's a lot more secular than it was. Do you think culture, was it was music and all of these things, could be the replacement? Uh, do, you, do, do could you just sort of tell me that? Could 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 culture replace religion? Like oh, or yes, do... I think so. Um, it 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 could religion requires it's hard work religion but it also requires not just a lot of thought it requires a lot of uh meaning and emotion too music i think is of immense importance to um to religion when you listen to the messiah for example um and uh it touches you and music it takes you into an, another mode Theology is often far too wordy. Uh, we are um, that there's there's a, 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 
was a wonderful book, 14th century, by a 14th century anonymous mystic called The Cloud of Unknowing, that, um, which is it's about how you can think, say things, but that the, the, the language it, it, it isn't going to do it for us. Somehow uh, music, touch, as, we, as we know, touches us profoundly, deeply, uh, but not in a logical way. And when we are uh, sort of ultra logical or ultra rational, we tend to kill um, any thought of, of, of going beyond yourself. Um, and I think, I think music is, is of great importance. Uh, the Gregorian chant, uh, which I uh, studied as a young nun, it's maybe rather, um, sound rather abstruse and, and dull, but when you get it in it, uh, and you have the Latin words, uh, the Latin words take on a completely different uh, tone with the whole way of the, mu the music, which touches us at, at a different level, uh, almost a, a sort of uh, profound level. Um, so uh, religion, it, it's not just about thought or, or meaning or, or, or logic. Uh, it's, it's about transcendence that you go beyond yourself, beyond uh, meaning, beyond, beyond your anxieties, beyond boring little me, uh, the ego that traps us in, 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 into our own little, little, little world. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I think a lot of things that you said resonated. I just wondered very quickly if you had any reflections on, you know, I understand that connecting with God, if that's a divine connection you need, can be done through others. But I was wondering, what if the self, and for that you need to let go of the self, of the ego, right? So what if the self has not yet been discovered or that you are in search of the self? And the reason why I ask this is because the concept of Iqbal, which is Hudi. So it's the discovery of the self, it, you trying to explore who you are before you can even think about these things. So I wondered if you had any reflections on, you know, what are the different journeys people are on? And so I, could, could yeah, you... yeah. So, in, so like you said, instead of connecting or, you know, finding God and God can be found in many ways through others, um, what if the self has not even, so that requires letting go of the ego, like you said. So for those people who haven't even found themselves or have not been very kind to the selves and not even, they're not even, their selves are not even recognized. So what do you kind of, do you have any reflections on that in terms of reaching God in different ways because God is for everyone, right? I think the question is, <laughs> sorry, you don't know yourself. Yeah then yeah. how are you to proceed? I don't know. I've never quite managed to understand myself. Um, I'm still struggling with it. Um, I think we all do, because we are all com complex beings and we have all kinds of um, sort of uh, problems and uh, difficulties, and especially when, when it comes to thinking about the divine. Um, I, for me, uh, music or something which takes is takes me beyond myself uh, i've never been very good at meditation which was a bit rather a drawback for a nun um was, we had to do that every morning and we had to sort of uh, prepare this meditation i could not keep my mind on it for five minutes whereas at, when i'm at my desk studying uh the time just goes and I, i'm completely lost in it um so i think that 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 everybody has to find their own way. For some people, it will be music. For others, poetry, because poetry uh, gets is is deeply emotional. It li it links things up that we don't logically put together, uh, makes us see things differently. Um, and um, but also seeing nature, looking at looking at the extraordinary uh, brilliance of the natural world. Um, but uh, just to opening ourselves to a sense of wonder, 
a sense how, of how amazing it is that we are here now, that we're the, that we're breathing, that we've that our parents produced us and made a unique person for good or ill. But nevertheless, uh, you have this is some this is something extraordinary that every single one of us here in this room uh, has uh, has his or her own world, his or her own preoccupations, fears, desires, yearnings, where each of us a sort of separate little universe to one another. And it's very difficult to make contact uh, with, with, with all this uh, between us. But that seems to me to be the marvel of the world, uh, that, uh, and that, that uh, somehow the fact that we want there to be sacrality, that things are utterly, that we want people and uh, the world, to be, we want to recognize that it is utterly sacred, that each person is of unique importance. Unique, uh, will un unrepeatable, uh, completely a world of special uh, value uh, and uh, to oneself, that one is unique, that every single one of us in this in this room is a world unto itself and, and a marvel unto oneself. And uh, we look at each other, each one of us is a mystery. And even our dearest friends, our dearest relatives are offered utterly mysterious to us, uh, remain out beyond us, from remain uh, sacred and special and surprising. And I think that that is the best way of looking at sacrality in a sense. Uh, not only is the, the natural world filled with wonder and insight that makes us, uh, takes us out of ourselves and makes us feel uh, at, uh, enhanced as the, the poets make that very clear, people like Wordsworth, uh, but also that each one of us, uh, however uh, mundane we may seem, is special, is unique, is unrepeatable, has his or her own particular sorrows, yearnings, mysteries, um, and, uh, and that that, that is a marvel and that we can sometimes come together and, and uh, share these things. But even though we don't share them, we can come away feeling perhaps, well, we're not alone in this struggle to find meaning and value in sure. life, which is often so uh, mundane and, uh, and, and, and boring, but is also special. In, I would request to be brief and very clear and speak slowly because she has some memory issues as well. Thank you. My name is uh, Hamid. I really enjoyed your talk. I also share the struggles you have with meditation. I cannot keep myself thinking about one thing at a time. My mind is all over the place. And if I, if I find a solution, I'll definitely keep you in the loop and I'll let you know. <laughs> And coming to my question, it's a very open-ended uh, question, a very broad one. Uh, you can answer any way you like. I'd be very satisfied. My question is, what would a world without the concept of religion look like? Ah, oh, that's very interesting. What would the world be like without a concept of religion? Now, it depends what kind of religion we have, because there's good religion and there's not so good religion. Um, but I think what religion and what art tries to do, I think the two are inseparable. Religion is often expresses itself best in art or music or poetry. Um, and because it, it takes us out of, of the logical and the commonsensical. 
and it also makes us link things that are uh, poetry is particularly good at that linking things up that are separate that we wouldn't have seen to have any any communication with one another or any any likeness but you suddenly say oh yes there's a resemblance there or that one sees a resemblance uh with um a a new thought uh with 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 a, a whole new culture perhaps uh when, when when you're you're reading and you suddenly see something that is different and special i think that that the world um we need to be artists in the world instead of just taking things um at in a sort of practical way that we could use in a utilitarian way and make uh be pragmatic about and make things um sort of uh separate or uh, in, in, in some way, uh, to, to, to see the connection between things. That's what poetry does, uh, putting uh, things together that we wouldn't normally have thought of. Or uh, music, uh, when put to, to words, could make us see the words in a different way and that can make us and sinks down into the depths of us in, in a different way. Uh, we go, go through life in such a very superficial way sometimes. We see so much and we, we in a sense too, we are in, in this modern world with our, with our televisions and our, um, our, 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 our emails and all the rest of it, we get clogged up with information. We don't have enough time for a bit of silence, a bit of time to just keep quiet for a while, to let things that are, are that have, have been running through your mind simmer down, and perhaps you start seeing things that are connected in some way, or you see something in a different life. But you need that 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 you but you need to be quiet and silent about it sometimes, and that means a silence, uh, not just lack of noise, but a silence in your mind so that it's not full of clamorous ideas, all asking to be uh, sort of sorted out or, or to, to, to be constructed in some way into some kind of meaning, just to allow uh, these difficulties to nurture in your mind. And sometimes it can take years, but sometimes it, the, 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 a, a solution can suddenly come when you least expect it. We need, uh, there's so much, um, talk in our world, isn't there? Oh, so much noise. Uh, you know, we, God forbid we should have a, an evening of silence. We, we, we immediately lunge for the television or the radio. Uh, we're, we're, we're driving, on goes the, the car radio and all, all the rest. Uh, silence is something that I think we should all have a bit in our lives. Only, only if only... 15 minutes and, and no need to sort of be all holy about it or, to, or think about God or anything, just, just silence, just listening to the, to the birds or the, or the traffic or, or people's voices or children's uh, voices at, 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 when you pass a school playground, just listening to that, listening, watching the, 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 the life around us. And I think uh, th that has been very much uh, sort of uh, with, with our televisions and our uh, earphones on and uh, God forbid we should have a little silence and quiet. I think we should all have about just 15 minutes a day. Uh, just think it, just don't think. Think any no good thinking any great thoughts or having some wonderful meditations or expecting some revelation, but just listening, watching. Uh, it's I think it's I think it's Wordsworth said it's a mind that uh, that something and receives a mind that receives. Let our mind receive these things and let them go into our heads. And they may develop into a sort of cocktail in, in some sense, a new, but just 15 minutes a day, I think, because 
that would have been in, in the pre-modern world, there would have been much more silence. Um, and we we are blocking it out. You know, we, we the, 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 as, as soon as we put, you know, the morning we wake up, immediately put on the radio, up come the voices, we need to hear the news, etc. But a bit of silence uh, to listen to the sights and sounds, let it come into us um, and, and give our minds a bit of quietness. Uh, and and sometimes strange things can happen. So ideas that you hadn't uh, thought of before could just pop up, or a memory can pop up that you thought that you'd completely forgotten about, but which you suddenly see is more important. But you need those moments of of silence, um, and um, and and that's not quite difficult to achieve. Right. On that note, I think so thank you so much for the commentary of us tonight. Yeah. I think we yeah. we have um now uh the words uh, yeah. Um, just appreciate your patience. We aren't able to take more questions, but Karen is here and uh, we'll have a reception so you can take your questions. Uh, um, she's an absolute legend. We're really uh, honored to have her here. And what a great pleasure to for her to speak about poetry in the Iqbal lecture because Iqbal wrote mostly in poetry um, and poetry was a great inspiration for him. Um, before I pass on to, uh, perhaps we can just invite uh, our uh, Mr. Habibullah Dada boy, who's specially traveled from Karachi, to come here. And I would, before I pass on the mic to him, I would also thank uh, my friend Mr. Amin Hashwani uh, in Karachi, who made this lecture possible by connecting us with Karen. Uh, and, um, and I know she's not going to a lot of lectures, um, but she accepted to come to Oxford. We are really honored. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed and distinguished guests, it is with immense gratitude and appreciation that we gather here today at the Oxford University for the third Alama Iqbal lecture series featuring Karen Armstrong and an enlightened exploration of spirituality. I stand before you on behalf of the Dadaboy Foundation to express our heartfelt thanks to all those who made this event possible. The Dadaboy Foundation, since the past four decades, have been supporting education across Pakistan, and since the last two decades, have been sponsoring the Dadaboy Institute of Higher Education, where 80% of all the students receive merit-based scholarships provided for by the Foundation. The Lama Iqbal Lecture Series is very close to our heart and symbolizes the celebration of knowledge, understanding, and unity. We would like to extend a profound thanks to the Oxford Pakistan program and Lady Margaret Hall for hosting this prestigious lecture series mm -hmm. and providing us with a platform to for intellectual exchange. Thank you. To the audience, thank you very much for your presence and continuous engagement. It is, uh, it is your curiosity and passion for learning that drive us to support our endeavors. I would like to extend our gratitude to Ms. Karen Armstrong for thought promoting wisdom and for her time today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, and thank you so much for taking our time. Uh, if anyone, if you're free afterwards, there's uh, a reception. Uh, a drinks reception afterwards as well. So please join us. Uh, in the monsoon room right next door. So. <laughs> <laughs>